A very warm welcome to episode two of our new season in the Cricket Library podcast series. Last time we had a fun chat with Cricket Tragic Nina Stevens. And if you haven't heard that one yet, make sure you have a listen after you listen to this one with our guest this time around, a debutante on the 1989 Ashes Tour. He came onto that Ashes Tour after taking 36 wickets in the 1988-89 season for Tasmania. He ended up taking a grand total of 120 first-class wickets, 18 ODI wickets, and 13 test wickets in the four test matches he represented Australia. If you haven't worked out who I'm talking about yet, I am indeed referring to Greg Campbell. He is the man who went on to that tour and did very well indeed. Only played the one test, but picked up 30 wickets at 27 on that highly demanding tour. We asked him about the scheduling around that tour, what it was like to put on the baggy green. We also have a look at the rest of his career as well. And we ask him about his batting bunny. I wonder who that could be. Well, we'll find out a little bit later on in the chat with Greg Campbell. We'll also talk about what the Ashes victory meant to both the players during the wonderful time in 1989 and those back at home also we'll talk about what he's up to now as well very good to hear that he is still involved in cricket and i'm sure you'll find that part of our chat interesting as well there is so much to enjoy about this one please sit back relax and enjoy our chat with greg campbell And it's a very warm welcome to Greg Campbell. Morning, Matt. Oh, afternoon, Matt. Whatever, whatever time it is where you are. Yeah, it's it's great to have you on the program, Greg. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start at the 1989 Ashes, and it's the 30-year um, mark since that all happened. For you as a youngster in your early 20s, how did that all come about? Well, yeah, it was look, probably a bit surreal, to be honest. Um, playing shield cricket, you know, I, I debuted in 85 and had two or three games with Tassie and then didn't probably play again to 88, 89 season. Yep. Um, got myself probably fitter and understood the uh, the game a bit more and understood my game a bit more. And, you know, that three years I was sort of out of it after I debuted, I understood what it what it took to be a, a first class cricketer and uh, it all went from there so 12 months you know in that 88 89 um domestic season i ended up being picked for australia so it all come come about quite quickly and that, and that was a pretty big season for you 36 wickets for tasmania was there any point in that season where you where you had a little inkling or a sniff that you might be going on the plane to england yeah oh, probably the last shield game to be honest man um we were uh, Playing, you know, 30 years ago, it's a long time. I've tested my memory here. I think we <laughs> played at the old Adelaide Oval, and uh, I know the chairman of selectors, Laurie Sewell, was, was in Adelaide at that time, and there was a bit of a rumour going around that, you know, there uh, might be a chance for that last spot. So, to be honest, you know, I had some idea, but no one ever said anything to probably after the Shield season, and there was a few, few good bowlers around there. You know, Craig McDermott missed that on that. Ashes series, Mike Whitney, you know, after taking seven wickets against the West Indies, was uh, you know in the uh, in the in the running. So, you know, I didn't really know until you know after the season finished, you you get the call. And and when the tour started itself, there, there was the one day internationals. You didn't figure in those games. Carl Rackman uh, was in the side when, when you were on the tour. Were you expecting to play test cricket or were you just happy to be there and enjoying the experience and anything that happened was going to be good anyway? Oh, look, you always want to play test cricket. I think uh, if you're happy going, you're happy to be there. I mean, that could be the, the start of the end, to be honest. Yeah. Maybe you want to get in that game. You want to 
you want to do it, uh, you know, you want to represent your country. We, we Back then, we played every county and even a mighty county. So there was a lot of cricket in between test matches, you know. We'd finish the test match and then jump on a bus and be playing county cricket the next day. Um, it's all changed now. But I had a pretty good uh, uh, tour of that Ashes, you know. No, I, I took done very well in the, the county games and probably forced my my way in there you're saying Carl Rackham was on that tour Carl um, did a knee early in that tour after the one day series so sort of opened up a, a bit of a door there that you know I might be uh, able to get a test match and so it happens uh, the first test match of that series I ended up being picked. And finding out that you were picked for that team in Headingley how, how much lead in time did you have to find out you were playing? Uh, the night before the night before wow. they, they cut the night, my roommate was Steve Moore. Yep. So we, no one bought it, was a bit superstitious back then. So, well, you know, once you started winning, it didn't change a lot. So, yeah, yeah, the night before, once they had the team meeting and they read out the teams that I read out the 12, and, you know, we'd been in uh, Headingley three or four days leading up. So you would think they were going to go with four quicks there. That was their talk. So that's what happened. So I was lucky enough to play in that test. And, and how was it rooming with Steve Waugh? That was a breakout tour for him. Um, any any insights on rooming with Stephen? <laughs> no, 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 look, that tour was magnificent. It got serious for Mark Taylor too, wasn't it? He had a great thing. But rooming with Stephen, you could tell earlier in the days, I mean, he debuted uh, before me and played a few test matches, but you can just tell he had that steel reserve about him. And, you know, he wanted to do really well and we were all the worst, worst test team to leave Australian shore. Yeah, the late Tony Gregg. So everyone on that tour, you know, had a point to prove. And you know, Stephen, like I said, you could just tell early on he was going to be a great player. You know, moving forward and look at his career at the end of it. Yeah, phenomenal career. And and it's hard to believe that he was dropped from the team within two years of that Ashes tour for his brother Mark. Yeah, funny guy. Um, yeah, if you go back through the. The legends of Test cricket back in them days, they all got dropped. You know, everyone has been dropped in their, their career and bigger and better and, than, it, than ever before. They learn, they, they understand what they've got to go and, and do to make sure their game is at top to be a Test cricketer. So I think everyone that's ever played the game that's come out to be one of the best Test cricketers ever has probably been dropped or have been dropped during their careers. Yeah, yeah. And now you mentioned just earlier that, there, there were county games after the test matches. So you played in that first test, you won the test, and then the next day you're playing against Lancashire and you take a, a five-wicket haul in that game. Uh, what, was, what was your body feeling like? You played – I know there was a rest day in that test match, I think, uh, and we batted for the best part of two days at the start of the game. H- how does the body recover and repair going into test match, county game, county game – more cricket after more cricket. Oh, look, that was just part and parcel of the game then, wasn't it? I mean, you know, you just did that. I mean, it was not even thought about, you know, the ice bath we had there, pardon the punt, was probably an esky with a couple of beers in it, you know. So, <laughs> so we, we, we played a lot of a lot of cricket even, you know, the Shield seasons back then were really hard four-day cricket. So, look, you, you were young and I was lucky enough to, like I said, I got myself super fit and, and, and just like bowling and I was a bit determined although we won the test and it was a good celebration that night back on the bus and then when we got to the hotel I didn't believe I bowled that well and you know hence I didn't play the next test or thereafter so I had myself something to prove against Lancashire and they were a very good team back then I think uh, Patrick Patterson and Wasa Macron were in that team um, from memory so yeah look that was just part and parcel of that tour and you know that's how we got. You just got up next day and played cricket. And, and the hunger and desire after missing out on that uh, second test match, Trevor Hones coming into the side, was the rationale there uh, AB wanted some variety in the attack and possibly um, Trevor Hones did quite well with the bat in that tour as well. Do you think that was a factor? Oh, definitely. We had two spinners, Tim May and Trevor Holmes, and AB was, you know, I mean, AB and his, his third Ashes uh, tour, 81, 85, and, you know, lost both of them, was determined to make to make a difference. And I think he's identified that Trevor being a leg spinner, and yeah, I can remember a team meeting where he, he said, you know, he's definitely going to bowl him at uh, Ian Botham. And, you know, I think Trevor got him out in the first inning. There was a plan. So, yeah, a bit of variety and, uh, 
you know, the, sometimes fork-based fork bowlers don't work and, and three in a spinner is, you know, ideal. So that was the rationale for moving forward there. And then coming back to Australia, what was it like uh, playing a test match in Tasmania? Yeah, well, the first ever test match uh, that Tasmania got, I was lucky enough to play and uh, David Boom was uh, my teammate and uh, there was probably three of us. Um, Steve Randall was the umpire back then. So it was a great feeling playing Sri Lanka, first ever test match. And, you know, the home ground support back then at the Old Belvery was uh, magnificently and lucky we got away with a win. Um, but, yeah, it always that's one of my fond memories of uh, playing for Australia and playing first test match at home. And taking five wickets in that game as well, uh, uh, you, you're happy with the way you bowled in that game? Yeah, look, I, I managed to play three more tests in a few one days. I, I thought I was improving every test match. Uh, back then, we, you know, test matches were a little bit, uh, uh, in, you know, a test match between a, a break. So, and I was probably a replacement for Terry Alderman. So, if Terry wasn't playing, um, I come in, and if, and, and if he was playing, I was, you know, I went out. So, yeah, look, I was very happy with the way I bowled, and I think we went to Adelaide after that too, and, you know, I thought I bowled all right there against the Pakistan. And uh, pretty good record against Wazim Akram, dismissed him both times. So is he, fair to say, Wazim's your batting bunny? <laughs> I wouldn't say that because I'm pretty sure he got me out. But yeah, it was just, uh, I think the second thing is you got 100, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He did so someone's got 100 in there. Yeah, someone, yeah someone's got to get him out. But look, yeah, I knew it wasn't uh, from a Lancashire days and, you know, when I played league cricket. So we had a pretty good uh, relationship. It was just one of them things, lucky that uh, I was around. I think he improved uh, enormously after that with the bat, though. And and white ball cricket, you got your chance to make your ODI debut on Boxing Day. Uh, how, how was that debuting? I think also Sanath Jayasuriya and Mark Taylor made their debuts in that game back in 1989. 45,000 fans in a, a big packed MCG at the time. How, how was that feeling? Yeah, well, you've done your homework. I think it was the only time there wasn't a test match and never been... Um, after and it never been before we had a one day on Boxing Day so it was a great feeling and we only flew in the day before wow. um, you know had home Christmas at home in Tassie and flew into to Melbourne but it was a great feeling to play in front of the G and in an ADI and not many people even when you talk about it now saying no that can't be right you wouldn't have played a, a test match on bo- uh, one day on Boxing Day but we did so you know it was a magnificent uh, occasion and you know, it was uh, one of them uh, surreal moments again that you never forget. And, and did you have any preference, red ball, white ball? Um, did you find bowling with the white ball um, favoured you or you preferred playing playing the, the longer formats? Oh, both. You know, you just took whatever, whatever come. I didn't mind uh, either of them. You know, field cricket was a lot of red ball and we back then we played, you know, nine games and only a few few white ball and when you got to Australia you played probably more white ball. So look it didn't really phase me. I didn't think too much of it. You just you just had to wake up the next morning and adapt to whatever was there. Yep. Yeah, and just sorry, just back on the eighty nine ashes, um that team, as you mentioned earlier, was uh talked about as being one of the worst teams to ever leave Australian shores and all that sort of thing. The response from back home, were you were you feeling uh, the love from Australia uh, back then? Oh, very much so as the tour went on. Back then, uh, mate, there was no mobile phone, so it was still telegrams and faxes you were receiving. And But we, we spent a, probably a week together in Melbourne before we, before we left. We did fitness tests, and you can just tell the vibe around the the guys was was enormous and then AB was leading that charge and with uh, Bobby Simpson but we were, we were fairly confident and you, and you look at the teams uh, the, that team mate there were some good players in the, in the end of their career the Dean Joneses the David Burns the Steve Wars the Mark Taylors the Ian Healy's you know it was a, a pretty good team to be labelled the worst team we thought felt very, uh, you know, it was unfair and, and some of these guys had uh, been on, like AB had been on to this is the third uh, Asher series. So we were quite confident that, uh, you know, we were going to do very well. And, and coming back to Australia, I remember I was I was in primary school at the time. Um, the, the team came back to Australia. There was a huge ticker tape parade in Sydney that I, I remember going to and the AB got the keys to the city and all the rest of it. Did 
Can you tell us a bit about that parade and, and what that meant to the playing group? Yeah, well, it was announced after we won the Ashes that there'll be a ticket day parade back. So, you know, me being quite young and never never been involved or never even seen one of them, it was, uh, again, a surreal feeling. You keep using this word that once we got back and you saw the public lining them streets of Sydney and, you you know, to win the Ashes back, that's when it probably really hit home, you know. Well, you're on the tour you're with your mates and you're playing cricket and everything was going well, but you probably got the enormity of it when we come home, how much it meant to Australia and, uh, you know, to win the matches back in England after, you know, losing in 81 and 85. So, you know, you then, again, then you knew the public were right behind you. And coming back to Australia, uh, your first class career blossomed again in season 1991, another 35 wickets for Tasmania. Where then you encountered some injuries. Um, was was that a difficult time for you uh, trying, to, trying to get yourself back Playing first class cricket again after after you'd uh, encountered a couple of injuries. Yeah, very much so. It was probably more the, the left knee that caused me the most grief. You know, I had an operation in Melbourne and uh, sort of worked very hard to get it back. And and then even when the doctor uh, who operated said he wasn't one hundred percent sure that that would be a success, and I forced my way back into the shield. It's, Season, I can remember it going probably the second shield game I played. I could just feel it go again. So yeah. um, back in the hospital, I knew sort of in my own mind uh, after the, the surgeon that said it probably wouldn't work first up, that okay. uh, second up was going to be uh, a really hard hard slog and it was just not, not the same. And I was a little bit different than most because I wasn't as tall as the most fast bowler, so I sort of had a straight front knee, you know, I sort of locked it in, so there was a lot of pressure going through there, so I had patella injuries and, you know, ligaments and all that, so it was going to be hard to, to come back. And leaving Tasmania, was that a was that a tough decision to make? Oh, uh, yes, yes and no. Um, look, I saw maybe, you know, in Tassie, I loved, loved Tassie and I still do, and that's where, you know, I always watch what they do down there, but I just felt maybe if I went to a, another state and a bit warmer weather that, you know, the knee might be not be might be better and I had another operation I arrived in into Queensland and then again it went, you know, in a practice in a second eleven going for Queensland. So that was the third time. So look, I, I never I don't regret it because they're the decisions you make way back then and our time in Queensland's been magnificent and it still is up to right up to day. <laughs> and and what is life like for Greg Campbell now? What What's the transition been like from playing first class cricket to being a cricket administrator now? Yeah, to, to, um, well, you hear the old cliche, isn't it? It's two different sides of the fence. As a player, you don't really understand what goes on behind the scenes to, to organise a cricket game, a cricket tour, or even get everything up and going. So, yeah, I've been up in PNG now for nine years and that went up there as a coach yep. and then took over. Uh, as general manager and now CEO for the last you know seven or eight years, so it was set up by former CEO Bill Lean. He did a magnificent job when he was there, you know, going to a country and putting the foundations in. So I've just taken over from where what Bill left, uh, where Bill left off, or, and it's been great, mate. Yeah, but you, you, you appreciate both sides. You get a lot more sense of what the players want, but what also as administrator you need to put in place to to make a country work and, you know, that's probably one of the proudest achievements except for playing for Australia, I I think I've ever done. And and PNG cricket quite well placed at the moment, both men's and women's under-19s teams in the top 20. Uh, you got ODI status in 2014, uh, hosting ODIs and first-class fixtures, uh, a, a lot of promise there in Papua New Guinea. Do you, do you see yourself staying involved um, as an administrator? Yeah, at the moment I'm sorry, two more years up there, so yeah. And I will look elsewhere to be an administrator. I enjoy that part of the game. Um, you're still a game, it's still a team, whether you're on or off the field, what you what you put together. So, look, yeah, the men and women are going very, very well. I mean, the women and the are off to a Women's World Cup qualifier in Scotland in August and the men have got a uh, T20 World Cup qualifier in uh, Dubai in October and that, that World Cup is in Australia and there's 14 teams there and 
six of them 14 will go through and you know there's five full members in that 14 Bangladesh, Sri Lanka Zimbabwe and you saw two of them teams just recently in this 50 over World Cup performed mm-hmm. very well Bangladesh and Sri Lanka so look we've got a lot on the drawing board for the next two years and you know our coach Joe Dawes is very much focused on the next three months uh, the men are in uh, Scotland in August like I just said and then they come back and go to USA in September and then they're in uh, Dubai in October so it's very much a professional game up there now. Yeah, the the progress has been outstanding and great to see other nations really pushing for that uh, elevation in status uh, in terms of the quality of the programs and the quality of the cricket that's being produced. Oh, very much so. You know, you look at Ireland and Afghanistan where they've come from in the last, you know, you know Ireland have been around for that mark for 10 years, but Afghanistan have come on leaps and bounds the last five or six years and there's no other reason they've can't be more associate countries push that out. The biggest problem with associate cricket is getting the quality of games under your belt and where yeah. P&G are placed, we're a long way from the Northern Hemisphere and a lot of the associates are in the you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, so a very dear exercise for us to travel. So yeah. hence we're working closely with Cricket Australia and New Zealand Cricket and hopefully, you know, we can play some first class teams in the in the next two years to get that quality of cricket under our belt. Yeah, that sounds that sounds very exciting indeed. Well, thank you so much for your time, Greg. It's, I've really enjoyed chatting with you about your career and um, really appreciate you giving us your time today. No problem, any time. Thank you, Ian. A massive thank you to Greg Campbell for joining us on Episode 2 of the Cricket Library Podcast. He was actually on annual leave when we had that conversation and I'm very thankful for his time in helping us to reminisce his career and of course that memorable 1989 Ashes series. Hard to believe they just rolled from test match to county game back into test match. Unbelievable the workload of the players back on that 1989 Ashes tour. A memorable one for Australia. Alan Border getting the coveted Ashes title back to Australia and the keys to the city after that magnificent ticker tape parade as well. Who would have thought was him? Akram, Greg Campbell's batting bunny. I don't know even know if Greg Campbell realised that himself, but uh, a pretty cool stat to have. I'd be spruiking that one far and wide if I'd managed to do that. And a big thank you to you, our listeners. I'm very thankful for the support we've had of this series. It's been very friendly, the feedback so far. So please keep that coming and please keep spreading the word far and wide. Anytime you get a spare moment, please give us a review on iTunes and a rating as well. That never goes astray. And of course, sharing in your personal networks is always appreciated from myself also. Plenty coming up in the coming weeks. We're going to be chatting with a rock star. He's an Aussie musician. Uh, He's over in Los Angeles at the moment. Had a couple of big hits in the 70s. I won't give too much more away about that. I'll get you guessing on that one. But a very enjoyable chat coming up in the next week or two. And plenty of Ashes cricket to watch between now and then. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been Matt Ellis for the Cricket Library Podcast. Bye for now.